Good evening. Um, I'm going to be talking about my father's 1941 Australian Scout Diary, which has opened up for me the history of internment of the German-speaking refugees during the Second World War and his individual wartime experience. Um, while talking about it, I'll be drawing both on the diary and my father's interview with the Imperial War Museum in 1997. By way of background, my father was born on the 28th of February 1923 in Frankfurt am Main and called then Hermann Gutmann. He died in 2007, aged 84 years. His parents were Siegfried Gutmann, born in 1886 Stuttgart and murdered aged 57 on the 23rd of July 1943 in Sobibor, and Elsa Gutmann, born in 1902 in Frankfurt, murdered aged 40 on 23rd of July 1943 likewise in Sobibor. My father was an only child, his father was a banker as was his father and his mother came from the family of antiquarians and art dealers. To quote my father, I remember relatively little except for a happy childhood in a middle class home in Frankfurt. We belonged to a Jewish community and participated not only in Jewish but in general communal life. From a young age my father experienced anti-Semitism and he recalled being attacked by other children at times in the street to the fear of his parents already at the age of 10 and he started to express opinions and he fought back. In 1936, his parents made the decision to send my father to Whittingham College, a Jewish boarding school in Brighton, where he arrived on the 5th of October, aged 13. My father recounted his own father's explanation to him for that decision. He feared that I would not be able to get the right education in the climate as it existed then. He feared that Hitler had succeeded in perverting Germany, the outlook of the people. He felt it amongst his colleagues with whom he had been very close to before. People, friends drifted away out of fear because they were under pressure in their careers and it was so permitted throughout society, it took courage to resist it. <coughs> My father traveled to England accompanied by a friend of the family. And at the train station in London, he was met by a relative who put him on a train to Brighton. My father's education at Whittingham, he said, was excellent and the teachers very good, but he had to leave following matriculation in December 1939, aged 16, because his parents were no longer able to send money to the school. Life had become extremely difficult for them, and by then they'd moved to Amsterdam. Shortly before his departure, in that same month, my father appeared before the internment tribunal at the school and he was classified as exempted from internment. And here I found an, an index card at the National Archive, which as you'll see was subsequently amended. Um, and a second one, which shows that he sailed on the Junera. After leaving school, my father found paid employment with the help of family friends. This was as a trainee on the shop floor of a handbag factory in Blackburn, Lancashire, where he was from February to May 1940. He lived with the family during his stay and people, he said, were very friendly. In May 1940, he moved to London to look for work and stayed in Gloucester Place. He was living on his own and unemployed, and it was there, aged 17 years, that a policeman came to his door on the 2nd of July 1940. The policeman told him later, all aliens are being round up for a few days internment. Their position will then be reviewed and most of them will be released again. My lad, you will be out and free again within a few days. He was then taken to the local police station where he protested he'd been before tribunal at school and classed as a friendly enemy alien. He was told, we have scrapped it all, we are bringing everybody in. He was taken to Regent's Park Barracks, then to Kempton Park Racecourse and two days later to Highton Camp near Liverpool. My father spoke of this being at the time of Dunkirk, of there having been an enormous fifth column scare. He also considered Churchill to have been directly responsible for the policeman's knock on his door. Although my father was a great admirer of Churchill, he blamed him for his imprisonment in Australia. He was firmly of the view that at Churchill's instigation at the last minute, just as internment was coming to an end, the younger friendly enemy aliens were rounded up as well. Churchill had given out the order, collar the lot. 
Following much reading and looking at the original documents at the National Archives, it seems to me the decision to intern class the enemy aliens still at large and deport them to Australia was arrived at not in a meeting of the War Cabinet, rather through a series of meetings, formal and informal, of people in the Home Office, War Office, MI5, amongst others. And I would place centre ground the Home Defence Security Executive, which had been tasked with making recommendations for action against persons who might constitute a fifth column and in particular its chair Lord Swinton along with two other members Colonel Harker the acting head of MI5 and Frank Newsom of the Home Office. To give you a sense of the timing from the documentation I've seen the idea of deportation to Canada was put forward on the 4th of June 1940 and to Australia on the 13th of June 1940. And it was on the 21st of June 1940 that the internment scheme to bring in Class C enemy aliens still at large actually took effect. The first stage of that scheme entailed bringing in all non-refugees with less than 20 years residence in the country and all unemployed, some 5,000 in all, with certain exemptions. It seems to me my father was taken in at this first stage because he was unemployed and living alone. The explanation my father was personally given by the commanding officer when at heightened camp for being deported out of the country was, he had decided that he would fill this transport, the Junera, with a place they have left with people under 18, with young people who will have a much better chance to survive overseas because he thinks the war is lost. My father did not want to be sent overseas and pleaded with him to no avail and the officer responded, if you were my son, this is what I would do to you. On 10th July 1940 at Liverpool Docks, my father boarded the Junira. It was bound for Australia, but he did not know that and nor did the others. Altogether, I have a more precise figure here, altogether there were 2,732 prisoners made up of 2,342 German and Austrians and Tunis, 200 Italian and Tunis, 190 German prisoners of war. And there were 141 guards, some of them brutal, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Scott and First Lieutenant O'Neill. And here is a picture of the Junera, taken from the Junera scandal by Cyril Pearl. Um, I've also found at the National Archives the nominal roll call of internees on the Junera. And as you'll see, it indicates that there was a net total of 2,329 German internees because 13 of them were found to be in Bombay. And you'll see here a list of those who were on board and my father's name appears sort of bottom left hand corner. In the diary my father touches on the journey with particular brevity. I won't write about the voyage because it was so horrible that I can only refer to it as a nightmare voyage during which most of my possessions were stolen from us by soldiers who seemed completely out of hand of officers who were bad enough by themselves. HM government, however, has done everything to punish all, all responsible, and Lieutenant Colonel Scott has been placed before court martial. Another officer is O'Neill, who himself mistreated in Tunis, other officers, Captain Robertson, etc. Growing up, my father recounted to us one story only from that horrific journey, and it was about guards smashing glass bottles on deck and making the internees run round the deck barefoot. Since then, my father has recounted more about the guards in his interview with the IWM. Trouble started when we were taken aboard the ship. The guards came from the Pioneer Corps, the educational standards at that time of people in the Pioneer Corps were low. I can best compare them to football hooligans. People themselves were not bad, but they just did not know any better than to tease and be cruel. They did not go to extremes, but there was just no thought, and Colonel Scott turned a blind eye. In his diary, my father outlines the route in detail. We left England on July the 11th at 4.30 in the morning. On the morning of the 12th, two torpedoes missed us and we zigzagged for some time. 24th July, arrived Freetown, Sierra Leone. 27th July, Takuradi, Ghana. 8th August, Cape Town. 27th August, Fremantle, Western Australia. 
2nd September, Melbourne, Southeastern Australia, 6th September, Sydney, East Coast of Australia. My father explained in his interview that he did not see the ship's arrival in Sydney because they were locked in the holds. When they disembarked and were taken onto the quay and on their onto trains, they were pleasantly surprised because they were Australian troops who immediately provided them with good food, and there was ample food, he said. The trains were bound for the end of the line, where there was a very small town called Hay in New South Wales, which is on the border of the desert, and they were greeted by a sandstorm. <coughs> In his diary, my father mentioned that the train journey took 18 hours and that, at first, we were disappointed because we expected a holiday camp. <laughs> he went on to describe their arrival at Hay and detailed how the camp there functioned. We were taken into a camp with huts with rows of barbed wire surrounding it. They guarded the camp and then expected, rather the initiative probably came from the internees, to administrate themselves. We formed a parliament where each hut applied two delegates into that parliament, which discussed the problems of the camp. It can go through half the night. It was very articulate, and the 2,000 refugees which arrived on the Junior at that time, this was the first convict convoy since the convict shipments which had stopped 150 years earlier, and most certainly the most talented people Australia had ever received in one boatload. <laughs> You had university professors, you had doctors, you had lawyers, you had people from every walk of life, therefore well qualified to organise themselves into a community. Within a very short time, people had been put in the camps. There were two camps, seven and eight, and I was in camp eight, had organised themselves into a community, administered in the same way as communities elsewhere. And my father was in Hay for eight months. And here is a map of camp eight, taken from the Generis scandal. My father um, was in the hut 10, which I've circled. Even a, even a fiscal system was developed, and for a short time, until stopped by the Australian authorities, the internees printed their own monetary notes for tender within the camp. My father became involved in newspaper distribution and participated in the parliament and lectures which took place in all fields. My father was even asked Sorry. Okay. My father was even asked by the commanding officer to give English lessons to troops guarding them. In his own hut, there were young refugees aged 17, 18 and 19 years. They slept on straw mattresses, on bunk beds. My father formed a boy scout group. In his IWM interview, he spoke of it having been the only Boy Scout group in an internment camp to be officially recognised by the headquarters in London with the help of a local scoutmaster. And this may explain the reason for the diary being a Boy Scout's diary. In the diary, he set out how he had organised the group and listed the scout members. And here's a memento with all their signatures. Britain established in a white paper, the government revised the regulations such that it opened the status of the internees in Hay. The slow shift in government policy had begun, as Roger mentioned, with the sinking of the Arandora Star on the 2nd of July 1940, and also the House of Commons debate on the 10th of July 1940 that is well worth a read. There you will find Eleanor Rathbone, Josiah Wedgwood, and Victor Cazalet protesting passionately about the treatment of enemy aliens and the conditions of the internment <coughs> camps. Following the new classifications, the government decided to send a liaison officer, Major Leighton, to act as a go-between for them, the internees and the Australian authorities. My father wrote about this in his diary. From London we have heard that Major Leighton, who is known to many people in here, is to come out to Australia to remedy the mistake of our being sent out here. Initially, the government proposed the eligible internees would be sent to the US and other countries, not back to the UK. Only in January 1941 did the government propose that Major Leighton recruit internees for the Pioneer Corps, in which the Australians, to which the Australians agreed, but on the basis at that time that they were not released in the country. As my father explained in his interview, number eight camp was totally refugees, 
which the Australians, of course, never would acknowledge. The Australians said they had agreed to take prisoners of war. This was the reasoning behind their refusal to release any of the internees in Australia until after Major Leighton had been, and then for some considerable time after. The entries in the diary about this read, 13th of March 1941, we were informed by the camp commandant that we can now file applications for the enlistment into the Pioneer Corps. This most probably is preliminary to the arrival of Major Leighton in Australia. And on the 25th of March, Major Leighton arrives in Australia. We've waited for him for months. Our hopes are very high. This will be a turning point for everything. 1st of April, Major Leighton has now arrived. His mission, one, Junera Camp, two, Pioneer Corps, three, Transmigration, and four, return of skilled workers to England. 15th of April, Major Leighton leaves us again and told us that he will be back within three months and with positive things to tell us. My father spoke to us of having been offered the choice of either joining the British Army and being able to leave the camp after a year, or of staying and then remaining in Australia. He said he chose the former, having a powerful wish to fight the Germans. During this waiting period, my father was moved from Hay to Tatura in Victoria. The reason for this, as recorded in his diary, was that Hay camps were needed for Italian prisoners of wars taken in Libya. My father wrote, 21st May, we leave also for Tatura number no. 4 camp, 200 pioneers, got up 2 a.m., left Hay 5 a.m., arrived Shepparton 4 p.m., camp 5.30 p.m., felt shocked when we saw Nazi prisoners in one of the sections. There were several camps at Tatura, with strict rules governing communication and visits as between them. My father was here for just under three months. He was separated from the friends he'd made in Hay. They were in number two and number three camps, and that was hard for him. In his diary, he describes number four camp, where he was staying. We begin to settle down. We live in cubicles, two to each of them, and each has a door of its own. As a matter of fact, the cubicles are small rooms. Twelve cubicles go to each hut, and there are eleven huts, two mess huts, one hospital, one store, and canteen. One kitchen, one absolution house, shower, bath and wash house. There are lovely hot showers and there are bathtubs which we cannot use because there's not enough coal to heat the boiler for sufficient hot water supply. There is by far more privacy here and only now I begin to realise what this means under our circumstances. The camp is divided into sections. We are in section C. The chaps from camp 7A in D, in A and B are Nazis and Italians respectively. Major Leighton visited the internees at Tatura. The entry for 17th of June 1941 reads, Major Leighton at camp, we're all to go back to England and very soon. He has placed inquiry with Ministry of Shipping full of hopes. 18th of June, Leighton informs us that all boys under 21 must have consent from parents or guardians to return home to England. <laughs> My father was then 18 and could not obtain his parents' consent. As I've mentioned, they were then living in Amsterdam and he was not able to communicate with them. He wrote to Major Leighton on the 25th of June to explain his position. And the entry for the 28th of June reads, Seen Major Scrubby about consent to return to England, got letter and copy wire from New York through solicitor, consent wire. It emerges, reading on, that my father had turned to his uncle Herbert, his father's eldest brother, who was then living in New York, and to his uncle Bernard, the husband of Aunt Helene, one of his father's younger sisters, who was then living in Welling Garden City, for written consent to return to England and to join up. During his waiting period, a tone of desperation begins to appear. 2nd of July, I've been interned today one year ago, one year behind barbed wire, all for nothing. How much longer will I have to stay? 10th of July, all we can do is to try not to despair. We don't know when we'll get out of here and a whole year has now passed by since we embarked and almost nothing of consequence has been done. 16th July, it's now two years since I've seen my parents last. I cannot write to them, but I'm thinking of them all the time. I pray for their well-being. May God protect them and may I soon be reunited with them. I won't see them before peace arrives. Victory over all the evil forces we are now fighting against. 
There was also some good news. 21st July, received letter from Aunt Jane from New York. I'm ever so happy because I thought her still at Vichy. And he was able to correspond with her. There was also work that he could do. In the diary, he, recording having, he recorded having worked in QM's store outside, stock taking, and he was paid six shillings a week. But he was not in Tatura for long, and on 11th of August, he left by train for another camp, which turned out to be in Barmira, a town in South Australia. He detailed the journey in the back of his diary, and they covered approximately 750 miles over 27 hours. At Barmira, he was in number 10 camp. He wrote of having received a prisoner of war reception and that they were indignant about this. A couple of people went on hunger strike and others refused to come to roll call. He also wrote, officers awfully embarrassed and with rue guards from camp and ordered the machine guns to be taken down. Major Leighton had gone quiet on them and they tried hard to make contact with him to find out what was going on. Barmira was an uncomfortable place to be, much like Kay with sandstorms. My father was put to work, this time outside the camp, at first clearing a field for the planting of tomatoes, then digging pothole holes round a new internment camp, later building the hut themselves, and this was 10 miles away. He earned a shilling a day for six hours work and was aware that the Australian workmen earned a pound a day. He missed his friends and became increasingly worried about his parents and still did not hear from Major Leighton. It all began to feel hopeless again. He passed the time studying and attending lectures. But on 29th of August at last, they heard from Major Leighton informing them that he was trying hard to procure shipping and that he would try and see them in a month or so. Then on 30th of August, to his relief, my father receives one letter from his parents by a friend in Switzerland. Over time, there was a slow movement of internees leaving Australia. It began with a trickle, and in Barmera, the numbers grew significantly. On 15th September, 64 internees left for Liverpool, Australia embarkation camp, and my father was not one of them. He wrote, Though I do not grudge anybody's going, I envy every one of them. I only pray that it may be my turn soon to return. And he experienced another dip in morale. 20th of September, my father wrote, I'm friendless in this camp, and all that people do is poke fun at me for talking English. And then I never believed before that chaps could possibly be have, have such nasty and suspicious minds as some of our people here. There was also Jewish servants in the camp, and my father recorded going to Rosh Hashanah services and having a nice supper. And then he really cheered up, because on the 24th of September, Major Leighton arrived unexpectedly and told them that he hoped to be able to send them back to England within a couple of weeks. My father wrote, confident, I feel more happy now, and I'm looking forward. On the 27th of September, 21 fellow internees arrived from number two camp Tatura, and among them was his very good friend Walter from Hay, who he had not seen for four months. On the 4th of October, my father left Bamira internment camp, where he'd been for just under two months at 11 a.m., along with 27 other internees, who, like him, had been accepted for the Pioneer Corps. They, they marched for an hour to the train station, and set off for Liverpool near Sydney via Murray Bridge, Melbourne and Albury. The journey took two days. They stayed at Anzac Rifle Camp Range where they joined the other internees who travelled earlier from Bamira. Over the coming days he was measured for suits, had his fingerprints and photographs taken, travel documents signed and given clothing by the military. My father finally left a week later on Monday 13th of October. He returned to England on the Stirling Castle. There were RAF from Singapore, sailors, Royal Artillery, merchant navy men from the Queen Elizabeth and free French on board. Three days later they arrived in New Zealand where they stayed for nine days they were not able to come off the ship. 20,000 tons of food were loaded and other internees from Liverpool joined them as well as NZ troops and there was a cargo of Lockheed Hudson bombers on deck. The Jewish community of Auckland made them presents of 60 cases of a whole variety of foods and, a and hundreds of people lined the wharf to wave goodbye. This time they were to be accompanied by another ship, the Ceramic. 
My father arrived back in England on the 28th of November and the next day at number five Pioneer Centre back in Highton, he became a member of the HM forces. And I imagine it was there that he was told to change his name to something English and he chose Dennis John Goodman. He had one week's leave in London and on the 9th of December he set off for number three training camp in Ilfric and Devon to join the 903 training company. He remained there until the end of the month, whereupon he joined the 251 company Cheltenham. My father was determined to play an active part in the war effort, and ultimately he was able to join the 8th King Royal Irish Hussars, a regiment of the 7th Armoured Division nicknamed the Desert Rats, of which he was very proud. And here is a picture of my father in front of his Cromwell tank. On 9th June 1944, D-Day plus three, he landed in his tank on Gold Beach at port en bassin with his Section A Squadron 8th Hussars. He survived the fighting and as he explained to Helen Fry for her book, The King's Most Loyal Enemy Aliens, the squadron consisted of 20 tanks with five men to each tank, namely a total of 100. Of these, only 10 were still with the squadron at the end of the war and I was one of those fortunate ones. On the 21st of July 1945, riding in a tank, my father was part of the Victory Parade in Berlin. Following a course at the number one interpreter school in Brussels, my father was seconded to the 8th Corps Intelligence Office in Hamburg and was allocated to the review and interrogation staff at Neuengamme near Hamburg. Interrogating and assessing Nazis was particularly disturbing for him. He knew by then that his parents, aunt and cousins, had been murdered in Sobibor and Auschwitz, and this is one period of his life he had huge difficulties in recollecting. My father was ultimately demobilised in February 1947. He made his life in England, though always travelling the world, which he loved. And it was on one of his travels that he met my mother, a Polish Holocaust survivor, then living in Nice. They went on to have children and numerous grandchildren. Family was important to my father. Um, what I'd like to do is also to show you um, um, the Boy Scout diary. I took photographs of it before I handed it into the Imperial War Museum and I also transcribed it. Um, you're welcome to have a look at it after the talk if you're interested. Over to you, Gina. Thank you.